Hey biologists, Mr. Fod here. Today we are going to be taking a look at cell size. First up are the must knows. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to be talking about how cell size and shape are going to affect the overall rate of nutrient intake as well as waste elimination. So to put things into perspective, uh, we want to try and envision like what this world that we're going to be talking about, this whole world of cells. So hopefully you had a chance to do the activity before this. That's the scale of the universe, because I think that that's a great place to start to try and understand this microscopic world versus the macroscopic world that you and I live in. So the world, generally speaking, is about to human size with a human scale. And that's not what we're going to be talking about here. We are going to be using microscopes to look at the microscopic world. So this does a pretty good job kind of... Um, you know, thinking of it from different scale perspectives. So we say that the unaided eye, here's approximately human height again uh, with measurements in our metric system. So we see the meters down to centimeters, millimeters, or even once you get to right here, this is mostly what we use when talking about the microscopic world. So we see this funky looking M or U, it's actually pronounced mu, M-U is really what it is. This is one of our Greek letters from the alphabet. And so when we take a, a look at like the human egg, for instance, this is 100 micrometers. So mu stands for micro is what it is, that prefix. Uh, or sometimes they might say micrometers. Uh, either or, it's a nomenclature thing, you know, algae, alga kind of thing, uh, potato, potato. And so this is 100 micrometers or 100 micrometers down to 10 micrometers and one micrometer. And then we move down into the nanometers. Uh, and as we move smaller, we can see uh, from the downward and upward arrows, we can see the unaided eye or sometimes referred to as the naked eye. So we don't need, you know, binoculars, telescopes, microscopes or any sort of thing uh, to assist us in viewing them. Then we move into the LM, which would be the light microscope, specifically compound light microscope, so that we're going to compound those lenses so that we can get up to a thousand times magnification. Then we move into the EM, if you happen to look at things extremely small, so viruses, ribosomes, lipids, proteins, those sorts of things, then we're going to need our, um, our electron microscopes is what they are. And there are two different versions. There is a transmission electron microscope uh, and a scanning electron microscope, a TES and an, uh, and an SES, uh, SEM rather. So most of the time we don't talk about those because those are on like the sub micro level. But for right now, we're gonna be focused on this microscopic world in which compound light microscopes are going to be the predominant tool. Now, the big thing about cells, if you've ever wondered, well, why are we made up of so many? Um, just to put it into perspective, we are made up of about 50 trillion cells. You heard me right, trillion with a T. That's a lot of cells. Uh, and so why are we made up of so many? Why aren't we just like one giant cell? Like why, why bother with all this whole cell division and then replication? Like why bother with any of that? Well, there is a scientific reason behind this. So first off, cells must be able to have this surface to area volume ratio. We want to keep this as large of, uh, of, of a surface to area to volume ratio, this ratio as much as humanly possible. Um, and then this chart down here kind of does it a little more justice uh, when we actually look at numerical values of things. In part, why we want a lot of surface area and, and as per our smaller volume, if you will, is that that surface area allows us to, to exchange materials inside and outside of our cells. Because again, the big difference between what makes a cell a cell is that it's a differentiation between internal and external conditions. Uh, and so we need to be able to exchange. So things like nutrients, vitamins, minerals, proteins, you name it, that we are occasionally going to have to transport things either internally or externally from the cell's perspective. Uh, so now we got some numbers over there. So we can see either we talk about one tiny little cell or like the little cube, the one by one by one cube. Or what about if we had a giant cell or a giant cube being a five by five by five? Or if we were to happen to take that five by five by five and chop it up into a bunch of little one by one by ones. And so when we do that, what we're actually doing is we're increasing the surface area. But notice we did not change the volume. So our surface area is going to move from an area of six, that's the single cube, to 150, which is an increase uh, and definitely increase the volume from one to 125. Uh, but 
when we get up to our, our big one with all the little tiny cubes, look at our surface area, 750. So every one of those individual cubes has its own calculated surface area because they're individual units, not one giant unit uh, like the middle cube there. Uh, and notice how the volume also didn't change moving from our five by five by five to all of our little tiny cubes. So we have the same volume, but what we've done is we've drastically increased the surface area from 150 to 750. That's 600 points of increase, that's wild. Then if we do a comparison, surface area divided by the volume or surface area to volume ratio, we can see that we're going to go from a 1.2, that's the giant cube, to 6, which are all little tiny cubes that occupy the same amount of volume. So that is huge. We've definitely almost six-fold increased our surface area to volume ratio. Let's take a look at some examples as to why the surface area is such an important thing. Uh, a good example in humans would be our small intestines or intestines in general. So when we zoom in, what we actually see are these finger-length projections on the, sur on the small intestine wall. We see these are called villi, or even if we go a little bit closer, we can see these microvilli, so they're even smaller than the big finger-length projections. Each one of these are going to help us as the food moves through our digestive tract, which at this point has gone through uh, the chewing process in our mouth, down our esophagus, down into our stomach, to then be dissolved into more of a liquidy state uh, into our acids and then dumped out into our small intestine. So we have this liquidy goop mostly. Sorry for the bad visual if you're eating something right now. Um, but it's going to be taking all of these more liquidy dissolved materials and now needs to absorb it internally so that it can get into your bloodstream and then transport it wherever it needs to go. But how is it going to then in, uh, absorb all of those vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that you just ingested and dissolved in your stomach is that we have increased surface area. So each one of these, if we then uh, kind of fold it is what we do. We see this folding technique is done time and time and time and time again, biologically speaking. You may recall, think back to our organelles, things like Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum. We see these sorts of folds are going to come back again and again and again. So this is, again, a great example for animals. If we take a look at another example, kind of more zoomed in actually, uh, we can see these are the microvilli. So as I mentioned, that each one of these folds that we see again and again and again in all of our different organelles, so again, increase surface area. Um, we'll see these again actually in mitochondria as well as chloroplast, um, as we're going to see some other examples once, once we get to those, talking about cell respiration and photosynthesis. Um, but we can see down to our microvilli, uh, we can see each of these if it happens to be uh, in absorbing, let's say, our triglyceride or fat molecules here, um, then it has a much easier time because notice all of these folds, again, increasing in that surface area. So it has a better chance and better opportunities then to then absorb those minerals and nutrients. So the big takeaway about surface area is you want a lot of surface area. And so what it does is it helps speed up that absorption process. If you have more cell membrane that things can, uh, can transport across, then it has, an has more opportunity to then transport across the membrane. Another great example would be uh, like plants, for instance, specifically their roots. So when you look at the roots of a plant, again, there are two parts to a plant. We have the roots and the shoots uh, and that we see down here is that they have all of these little roots will then, as the plant matures, be spread out in all sorts of different directions. Again, look at the amount of surface area. It's not going to be one giant, like, thick stump of a root. They want to then have all these little tiny roots. Nothing more better illustrates this than, for instance, let's say, a germinating seed. So we have all of these little, little, tiny uh uh, these little root hairs is what they are doing, and they allow, again, to increase those surface area because of all the different folding structures and allow them to intake materials. I hope this helped. Let me know if you have any additional questions. You can always email me, jfod at shoring.org, or you can always send me some Schoology messages. Have a great day.